Well, now, a new weather centre has opened today, not for forecasts here on Earth, I hasten to add. Instead, the new centre, which is uh, in Exeter, will be looking at uh, changes in the weather millions of miles away in space. And uh, in a moment, I'll be talking to an expert about that. And uh, Marek is with us. Thank you for coming in. We'll talk to you in a second. Before that, our science correspondent, Jonathan Amos, tells us a little more. We live next to a colossal nuclear engine. Our star's energy sustains all life on Earth. It can also present us with some problems. The sun is constantly throwing radiation and particles in our direction. The mild effects are quite beautiful. The northern and southern lights are generated in these more gentle storms. But it's the really big outbursts that most concern scientists. Storms that have occurred in centuries past pose a greater threat to us now because we're so dependent on technology. These bigger events have the ability to disrupt the electronics in satellites, degrading our ability to forecast the weather and send communications around the world. Your ability to send emails, use credit cards or even trade on the stock market could become very difficult. A large solar flare could induce huge currents in power grids, leading to electricity outages that last weeks or even months. In the worst storms, aircraft might even have to be grounded because of glitches in their avionics and because of degraded radio communications. The keys to resilience, say experts, are the ability to forecast storms before they hit and to build in the necessary contingencies so that if systems go down, they can be brought back online as quickly as possible. Jonathan Amos, BBC News. Well, with me is Dr. Marek Kukula from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich to explain a little more. Marek, thanks for coming in. So for those of us who, frankly, know nothing about this, what is the purpose of, beyond what Jonathan said there, a weather centre for, for outer space? Well, as we've learnt more about how the sun behaves over the last few decades, we've come to understand that it's actually quite a violent object. And so really we should have been worrying about this for several decades as we've come to depend more and more on the kinds of technology that can be affected by it. So this is actually a bit of good news that for, for once we've, we've put together something which is going to give us a bit of warning and allow us to perhaps do something about one of these events if it happens. Uh, describe one of these events in a little more detail. What would constitute an event which could then disrupt lots of communication or other things on, on Earth? Well, huge explosions are, are taking place regularly on the surface of the Sun. These can blast material out into space and if that material hits the Earth it can affect our magnetic field which is sort of like our shield from what's going on around us and it can induce all sorts of effects closer to the ground. All that radiation of course is also very very damaging to satellites which are up in orbit and if our satellite network goes down communications global positioning systems, all of those things go out and of course in the last few years we've come to depend on those so much. Uh, a, a viewer watching might think, well hang on a second, if you're looking at the kind of forces at work here, there's very little you can do about them. So when you talk about preventing or precautions, what are we talking about? We cannot stop these events from happening but what we can do is have a little bit of warning so that we can protect our technology from them. So things like powering down satellites, putting them into safe mode, perhaps switching off some of our electricity networks until the danger is past. It's much easier to switch them off and then switch them back on again than it is to have them completely destroyed and then have to wait weeks or months for them to be repaired. And imagine what society would be like with no power, no communications, no internet, no global positioning systems. It would be chaos. Um, what kind of warning do you get? I mean, I'm just thinking, what is the time scale of a warning before an event? Well, there's a reason we refer to this stuff as space weather, and that's because it is inherently quite unpredictable. However, we, when we see one of these things starting, we know it takes between a, a few hours and a few days to reach the Earth, so at least we have that amount of time. And what scientists are looking at now is ways of predicting further in advance when one of these things might be likely, and whether or not, if it happens, it might hit the Earth. So we're learning more all the time, and the more we learn, of course, the more warning, hopefully, we will have. Uh, and this facility in Exeter, um, you know, how pioneering is it in the sense, you know, is there anything else comparable elsewhere in the world, or, I mean, where does it stand? The Americans have been doing this for a while. Um, UK universities and, and European universities, their researchers there have been tracking these things and trying to understand them better. What hasn't really existed here is a coherent mechanism for getting the warnings together and getting it out to the people who need to know. OK, Dr Marakukula, good to have you with us. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks a lot. Um, OK, so it's four minutes to six and uh, I'm not going to make any silly jokes about the weather. Um, and hand over to Jay for a bit of our weather, Jay. Thanks, you. Well, appropriately enough, I think.